Okay. Today we are talking about hematopoietic tumours, which include what? Lymphoma. Yeah. Leukemia. Good. Multiple myeloma. Good. Is that it? I think that's it. Histiocytic diseases are tissue cells, as much as they're not sort of localised necessarily. Um, we can talk about them a little bit because we probably won't have another session covering them. Um, and mast cell diseases, tissue cells as well. So whilst they're kind of blood cells or are allowed to be in the blood, um, they're sort of not really classified as hematopoietic tumours. So because lympho is what we see most commonly, that's what I want to spend the majority of time on. Does anybody want to cover anything specific? Not really? No. Um, so just because it is oh, exam time, sorry, <laughs> I have to bring it up. Um, well, I have sort of put together a couple of slides just to try and make it a bit case-based, like more sort of what the way that you'd approach a question, I think, in the exams. And we will go into a little bit more detail um, as we talk, but it's going to be pretty casual as far as what we want to cover and try and keep it kind of, you know, well, what if this case had this change sort of thing? Does that suit everybody? Cool. Okay, first, before we go on to like the case-based stuff, what what causes lymphoma? Just in case, like when lymphocytes keep multiplying, that's what lymphoma is. Yes, I should have worked that better. Um, what is the etiopathogenesis of lymphoma development? Are there genetic causes? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, so what breeds do we typically see lymphoma in or are overrepresented for lymphoma? Golden Golden good, mm -hmm. yeah. In Australia, border collies, that's not really in the literature, but certainly in Australia. Um, pretty much any dog that starts with a B, you could write that on your exam. <laughs> Beagles, Bassets, Boxes. There's another one that's the second word is a B. I didn't write it down. Um, anyway, just write B names on there. Border Collie, Beagles, Bassets, Boxes. <laughs> um, so we know that there's a familial component to it, which means it has to be a genetic component to it, right? Yeah. Um, so I found this really interesting. 25% of dogs with lymphoma have three chromosome 13s there's some link with trisomy 13 13 yeah um, and lymphoma um and then you know we were talking i'm going into this only because we covered it a couple of weeks ago um with the kind of what causes cancer the hallmarks of cancer um but as far as the other kind of genetic changes which contribute to development of lymphoma we can see a combination of reduction in the tumor suppressor genes and an increase in the oncogenes. And specifically with lymphoma, that the RAS oncogene is increased. Um, what other, so that's sort of the genetic stuff. What about environmental um, things that have, have been linked to lymphoma? Think about cats. If I be the LV. Good. Who said that? Me. Excellent. <laughs> yes. So infectious causes. Um, FIV, FELV are by far the most common. Um, what else in cats? Where what would be probably the most common form of lymphoma that we see in cats? Elementary lymphoma, is that what you're Good. And what is that a kind of sequelae of? IBD. Good. So etiology of the development of lymphoma would be? Inflammation. Good. Exactly. Inflammation. 
So yeah, that, that can be inflammation anywhere. So inflammation in both cats and dogs is linked to the development of um, lymphoma. Um, going back to infectious causes, actually, there's one more that's kind of interesting that I probably wouldn't expect you guys to know, but Josh, uh, <laughs> uh, have you seen any infectious causes or infectious links between gastric lymphoma in cats? Uh, no, you mean like Helicobacter? Like, I haven't seen that before. No, no. So the, the gastric associated lymphoid tissue reacts to the Helicobacter, or so Helicobacter infection is more common in patients with gastric lymphoma, and they think it's because of chronic activation of that gastric, the GALT gastric mm. associated lymphoid tissue. Um, so the, um, lymphomas that we get in the stomach in cats may be linked to helicobacter as well. Um, anything else environmental? Did anybody, um, follow the glyphosate trials and stuff overseas? No. So, um, Roundup essentially is associated with lymphoma in humans. And that link hasn't really been made. Um, but that's probably because of the numbers that we're dealing with in our studies. Um, but that's potentially herbicide question mark. Um, tobacco smoking exposure in cats is linked to lymphoma development. Um, what else? What about radiation, like electromagnetic yes. in humans? Haven't got links in animals yet, but certainly lymphoma is more common in patients that have had other cancers and had treatment for other cancers. So chemotherapy or um, radiation therapy for sure. Um, the other yeah. one that I find interesting because we were talking about the immune system and the role of the immune system in preventing cancer development, what medication that we use fairly commonly might predisposed to lymphoma development immunosuppressive medications like cyclosporin yes thank you excellent um so if you dampen down the cytokine response to inflammation uh and you decrease lymphocyte activity as uh, if you decrease that immune activity um you will increase lymphoma there's over uh, cats in particular on cyclosporin have a much higher incidence of um, lymphoma. I'm not sure if that's true for dogs, actually, but in theory it is. And when they first did the trials for oclocidinib, Apoquel, which is a cytokine inhibitor, and it's quite a specific cytokine inhibitor, um, they had increased incidence of lymphoma in the first kind of round, but they didn't have enough numbers for that to be conclusive. So I don't know how that sort of panned out now that we've used that a lot. Um, but cytokine inhibition predisposes to lymphoma development. Um, okay, so they're the kind of causes of lymphoma I wanted to cover. I just want to make a list quickly of, um, nah, let's go into a case. <laughs> um, let me share. Hmm. Hmm. Mm, can you see my screen? Is it just Zoom? <laughs> yeah, you can see the ultrasound image. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm glad you can see it. I can't see it. Um, there we go. So just an ultrasound images image everybody's got? Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. So you've got a four-year-old golden retriever who has presented due to increased respiratory noise noted at night, but is otherwise eating, drinking, urinating normally. Um, on examination, you feel huge golf ball size, lymph nodes in the submandibular region, prescapular region, popliteals, every lymph node you can feel is golf ball size. So we have diffuse peripheral lymphadenomegaly, but no other clinical signs. 
What's our leading differential? <laughs> lymphoma. Lymphoma. Good. Tell me more. What type? What type? <clears throat> Don't we have to do immunotype for that? Like, can you just multicentric? Multicentric. Oh, Good. Is it that time? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So localized. I should have said what localization. I think type would be inappropriate. I'd be more careful about my wording if I was writing an exam, but. Um, Multicentric is right. Based on the knowledge that we have now, what stage is this? A. E. Four. Why four? This in, I mean, she, oh, gee, sorry, do you, are we using this ultrasound image or are we? Oh. Not? <laughs> Dude, you can't, you've jumped ahead, Josh. Sorry. Um, Three. No. <laughs> So it's at least a three. Why is it a three? What makes it a stage? Would somebody tell me about the stages of multicentric lymphoma in dogs? It depends on the side of the diaphragm, how many lymph nodes are involved and whether it's on both sides or one side of the diaphragm. Perfect. Yeah. So what if I what if we redid this case and this dog only had one lymph node enlarged, some mandibular lymph node? What stage? One. Stage one. one. What about if it had both submandibulars, but no popliteals. Stage two. Two. Excellent. And diffuse stage three. What makes it jump up to a stage four? Spread the visceral organs. Yes. So which ones are usually affected? Liver and spleen. Liver and spleen. Excellent. Good. So this ultrasound image, Josh, is actually a lymph node in the abdomen. So technically this dog would still be a stage three. Um, so what I wanted to point out, if anybody's doing their ultrasounds, is the sort of imaging characteristics of lymph nodes. And I guess like, you know, what, what other differentials should we have on our list for a dog that's come in with diffuse lymphadenomegaly? Infectious diseases like alechia. Good, exactly. So um, systemic infectious or inflammatory diseases. Um, imaging characteristics of a very inflamed lymph node or very active lymph node are that they are darker than the surrounding fat. Most lymph nodes are usually fairly isoechoic to the surrounding fat. So you can see this fat here is much brighter than the lymph node. You can see there's almost different regions of the lymph node. There's this sort of bright patch here and a bright patch here. And then there's this like hypoechoic rim around it. Um, so darker rim around it. And that's pretty much increased fluid. So whether that fluid's inside cells or not, um, the, this lymph node is very active looking. I don't know how much you can see, but the measurement down the side shows it's 39 millimetres in size. So if you sort of think about that, it's quite a big lymph node. They should be under five millimetres um, in width across this dimension. Um, so when we see reactive lymph nodes, they're typically kind of five to 10 millimetres, rarely get up to 15 millimetres. Lymphoma is really the only thing that causes lymph nodes to get this big. So whilst you still need to get your cytology and things, you should be very suspicious if you've got a dog with golf ball size nodes and the cytology comes back inconclusive, get histo. Make sense? All right, so I'm going to go on to the next case. So this is a dog. It's a four-year-old cattle dog who came in with PUPD and incontinence. And you do some blood tests and you see this. What's our problem list? Hypocalcemia. Mm -hmm. And... Azotemia. Excellent. Yeah. And if you're an exam, I want you to put the PPD and the incontinence and lethargy. Um, okay. And the other thing in the exam I want you to write is total hypercalcemia because what other tests should we do to clarify this hypercalcemia? Ionized calcium. Good. Exactly right. Yeah. And why do we need to clarify that? Because the ionized calcium is the free calcium that is metabolically able to be used in the body. 
Exactly. Yeah. So what artificially might cause hypercalcemia without an ionized, the total hypercalcemia without an ionized hypercalcemia? If you had a high albumin. Great. Excellent. Yeah. And there's a couple of other artifacts and stuff like lipemia and things that can um, disrupt particularly in-house calcium measurement. Um, but they're actually pretty good. Most of the readers are pretty good now um, with the um, interference. Um, so this dog does have a ionized hypercalcemia as well. How do you interpret the azotemia? I guess it can be difficult because the calcium can affect the kidneys and cause an increase in the, like you can basically get an azotemia from both the increased urination from the calciuria, mm -hmm. which can, and direct damage from the calcium as well can increase, cause kidney damage as well. Excellent. Yeah. So calcium is nephrotoxic. So we you've given me two reasons why the calcium might have caused the kidney problems is there any situation where we might have kidneys causing the hypercalcemia renal secondary hyperparathyroidism excellent yeah um what about what if we're sort of what are, okay what are our differentials in this dog sort of leading three differentials in this dog for the hypercalcemia. Given that we're talking about lymphoma, lymphoma's got to be on our list, so hypercalcemia malignancy. Perfect, yeah. Renal disease for other causes. Emma. Yes, good. Yep. yep. And then I guess primary hyperparathyroidism. Give them at the yes, that's, that I would definitely give that full marks. Absolutely. Um, the reason why I balk, and this is very much an instinctive thing, and P, so dogs with primary hyperparathyroidism are rarely azotemic. So there's mm, some okay. thought that PTH is actually nephroprotective against the impact of hypercalcemia. So it's just a like clinical thing that's lower on my list but technically it should actually that's exactly you're exactly right it should be on the list based on textbook um what so say we're talking about hypercalcemia of malignancy oh there's one more differential i want you to get actually hi boy yes thank you very much that's excellent um so with azotemia and hypercalcemia are both symptoms of hypo A, so that should absolutely be on your list. In fact, if you're sitting medicine exam, just put Addison's on the list for everything. Um, so in this dog, what form of lymphoma might cause hypercalcemia and azotemia? B cell, like is that what you're sorry? E is it D cell? Like that's is that what you're asking? Like which um so this is a dog that doesn't actually have peripheral lymphadenomegaly. So this is a separate case. Um, uh, what I'm trying to get at is this cat, this dog could have renal lymphoma, have bilateral renal dysfunction causing azotemia and a hypercalcemia potentially. So as far as sort of what I'm looking for on the ultrasound when I'm looking at this dog, um, so no peripheral, like physical examination is completely normal in this dog. Um, so we do an ultrasound and the kidneys actually look completely normal as well. So I've ruled out my, uh, well, I shouldn't say I've ruled out renal lymphoma because it sometimes can be really, really subtle, but I think it's really less likely in this dog. So where the rest of the abdominal ultrasound is also normal. Everything looks normal, four-year-old dog normal. Where else, and we do a stim test and that's negative, it's normal. And what else do we need to do? Our urine is quiet. There's no evidence of pyelonephritis or active sediment in the urine. Have we done Have a rectal? Ionized calcium yet? We've done an ionized calcium and it oh. is high. It's a true oh. hypercalcemia. Yeah. Have we rectal. done a rectal? We have not done a rectal, but we should do a rectal. Thank you. And the anal glands are palpably normal. What about the thymus? 
Simon. Love Simon. Oh, I love it. Well done. What test are you going to do? Test rats. Test rats. Test rats. Good. Well, I was already ultrasounding, so I ultrasounded first. But this is a mass in the cranial mediastinum of this dog. Uh, I think it was about 10 centimetres in diameter or something. You couldn't really miss it. And this is not this dog's x-rays. I'll just clarify. But I just wanted to highlight how subtle cranial mediastinal masses can be on radiographs. So this is a dog that had exactly the same presentation, hypercalcemia and um, normal abdominal ultrasound and peripheral lymph nodes. And this is not the 10 centimetre mass. But can anybody tell me what they're seeing on these radiographs? Elevated trachea. Good. Excellent. There's a soft tissue opacity just below the trachea in the area of the cranial vena cava. Excellent. It's also a very slight pleural effusion. Agree. Yeah. Anything on the DV? DD. Is there a slight widening of the cranial mediastinum? I agree. This little ball. Oh, see daisies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this little ball shouldn't be there. Mm. So this, this shouldn't be a kind of like prominent bit of the radiograph. It should just all be long in there. You shouldn't really be able to see the mediastinum at that level. Um, Okay, so this is a dog, and the reason I sort of put one dog's ultrasound and then this dog's radiographs up is if I'd ultrasounded this dog on the chest, I probably wouldn't see anything. See how this lump is quite dorsal and it's surrounded by lung on both sides? So just because you can't see it on an ultrasound doesn't mean it's not there. You should definitely do radiographs as well if you've happened to do a TFAST first. So let's talk about thymic lymphoma or cranial mediastinal lymphoma, I should say, because it can be in the sternal lymph nodes and things as well. Um, does anybody know what, what um, T or B is more common? T. T, did you say? Good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, T. How do you remember that? Uh, I remember random things. It doesn't work normally, just random things come up. Yeah. <laughs> um, T for thymus is how I remember it. Um, so the reason why this case is kind of interesting is that T cell lymphoma is more likely to cause hypercalcemia than B cell lymphoma. So if you're sort of going, well, this is weird, I can't find the lymphoma, then and but you've got the hypercalcemia and no other cause of the hypercalcemia on your testing absolutely look for places where t-cell lymphoma develops what other places are likely to be t-cell that's a hard question can we say that in cats elementary in cats good Diffuse elementary or focal elementary? Diffuse elementary. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Um, anywhere else in cats that like to get T cell? Would be nasal. They more likely to be T. I can't remember. Are they They're actually almost like twenty five percent T, seventy five percent B nasal. Okay. Um. But the main one is nodal. Well, if you've got multicentric lympho in cats, more likely to be T than B as opposed to dogs, which are more likely to be B, the multicentric ones. Do you see many nodal ones? I very rarely see a kitty with nodal. Actually, yeah. I'm struggling to think of one. No. I think they get more like single nodes in their abdomen and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be nodal. Like sometimes I see big jejunal lymph nodes and I can't find a primary and I can't find elementary evidence of elementary lympho. 
Um, so I'd have to call that nodal, but it, like it's not a true multicentric lymphoma. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go on to next slide. Oh, okay. So you have a patient with palpable splenomegaly and mild lethargy. Otherwise, clinical exam is normal. And you and blood bloods are normal, so biochem, hematology, um, and everything all within normal limits. So you get an ultrasound done of the spleen. And I've just put this the paper here just for reference where I got the um, images from. Um, but you do this ultrasound and you see a spleen that looks like it's got moth holes, it's moth eaten. So little hypoechoic lesions right throughout the spleen and the spleen is enlarged. Now we've got no other lymphadenomegaly. It's only the spleen affected. We're talking about lymphoma. <laughs> so it's probably going to be lymphoma. Um, what forms of lymphoma might only be in the spleen? When you say form, do you mean like nodal or do you mean large cell or phenotype? Or Pretty much phenotype? All, of, all of the above. Yeah, okay. I guess what I'm getting at is um, the spleen is a lymphocenter. It's, it's essentially a node of its own. Mm -hmm. So we can just get B cell multicentric almost that's about to become multicentric and it's just not there yet arising in the spleen. But there's also very low-grade indolent forms that can affect spleen on its own. Mm -hmm. So how would you, so we, we've just got a huge spectrum of manifestations of lymphoma and some are very aggressive and some are very minimally aggressive um, or indolent. And how would you go about sampling this? What diagnostic? Um, you could, options we have. Uh, I would do a finely aspirate and cytology, but you could consider, it might be a bit bold, perhaps is a splenectomy because the percentage of those will be curative almost, mm -hmm. or at, at least a very good prognosis if it's just in the spleen. Very good, yeah. Um, so I don't think an FNA is the wrong thing to do at all. It's definitely the less invasive thing to do but it can be really hard to differentiate the more aggressive forms of lymphoma from the indolent forms without that tissue architecture. So you might get a diagnosis of lymphoma, B-cell lymphoma, and start a CHOP protocol in a dog that actually didn't need any therapy for two years and then only needed clarambucil and PRED. Um, so okay. in, in this sort of clinical situation, the, those hypoechoic punctate lesions are quite, um, it's not 100% sensitive for lymphoma or specific for lymphoma, I should say, but it's pretty up there. So this paper looks at different sort of appearance of lymphoma in the spleen and there's not that much that causes that, the whole punch effect in the spleen. Um, so if you see that sort of looking spleen, and no other nodes are affected. The liver looks normal. Every The dog is otherwise normal apart from its big spleen. I think an aspirate is warranted, but I think you should probably plan to go to splenectomy. You're going to decrease your, uh, the tumour burden and you're also going to get a more accurate diagnosis just based on that knowledge that there's quite benign forms that can um, arise in the spleen. Cool. Yeah. So it's not too bold. <laughs> Not involved. I don't think so. No, I think, yeah, I think it would be the preference. And it's one of the only times that I'm like, yes, you should definitely do histology rather than just rely on cytology for your results. Okay. Um, what is another, I guess, if you had a dog that came in with just one node affected, so stage one multicentric, how would you go about diagnosing that one? 
you know, it might be a good one to get a biopsy, a bigger biopsy as well, if it is indolent. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's behaving quite benignly, isn't it, if it hasn't gone to all the other nodes? So even if it's quite a big node on its own, maybe take it out, get some histo on it, get more information and decrease tumour burden while you're doing it. What about... Um, Hmm. When else would I get histo? I've got one example. Tell me. Tell <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a case at the moment, actually. Um, it's a seven-year-old Australian terrier that has um, no peripheral lymph node enlargement, but general chest, um, thoracic and abdominal lymph node enlargement, like three centimetre lymph nodes like, um, mm, through wow. its chest and abdomen, yep. presented for a bicapital neoplastic effusion. Um, FNAs came back as lymphoid neoplasia, mm -hmm. no negative for immunocytochemistry for TNB markers. Um, but I've been chatting to the oncologist about it and they think it's leukaemia just based on that. Wow. So Is it like peripheral? No, none. <laughs> so it's a really oh, good one. Wow. So this one, I think, needs histo. <laughs> yeah. If you're yeah. Not, not getting, so I guess, the answers right. on your FNA. Yeah. Um, leukemia. I know. It's through me. I don't really understand it, to be honest. But <laughs> I am. Um... Um, have they suggested bone marrow? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That'd be interesting. Well, flow cytometry is kind of what they're recommending. But, yeah. yeah. On the bone marrow? Bone marrow um, and, nodes. and lymph nodes potentially at bone marrow preferred. Um, I think one thing that kind of pushed the oncologist one way was on the CDC, there was like a couple, a couple of abnormal cells seen, but not enough to do flow on them. Uh, okay. So I thought it was stage five lymphoma or something. Like yeah. going that way, but. Mm. Interesting case. Mm. Um, okay, let's then talk about the limitations of cytology in diagnosing lymphoma and mm. what other options mm. we have. I guess, Anna, can I throw in there before we leave the question of mm. when else would you biopsy? It would be that cat that you're trying to differentiate between right. is this small cell IBD, uh, small cell lymphoma versus IBD? And sometimes they have both. Oftentimes they have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's a really good point. So I think when we've got, we assume that we're going to have a mixed cell population. So when we've got a suspicion that there's been a lymphomatous transformation from mm. an inflammatory condition. So we're going to have inflammatory lymphocytes there. We're going to have a mixed population of lymphocytes, but there might also be a clonal population of lymphocytes. And cytologists mm. are going to tell us that. So yeah. that's a really good point. Um, and then the other situation I think might be if the lymph nodes aren't golf ball size, if we've got maybe diffuse lymphadenomegaly that's a little bit more subtle mm -hmm. and you're sort of thinking, oh, could this be a systemic inflammatory process, systemic infectious process, then potentially histo and culture of that tissue might be beneficial. Um so they're the sort of situations where I think cytology is a little bit limited. What add-ons short of histo, if we can't get a biopsy, owners decline surgery, what other testing might we be able to do on our cytology or aspirates? Both cytometry and PAR. Good. Excellent. Um, so tell me about flow cytometry. What is it? when it's when they you they basically it's, it's a bit like your auto analyzers in for cbc's yeah yep. um so i think they get the cells and they um basically mark the cells with antibodies that mm -hmm. fluoresce in some way or uh, like scatter in some way and they run it through a um a flow machine or an auto analyzer yeah and what are those antibodies directed at um like different like CD markers, um, so like CD4, CD8, 34, those kind of mm -hmm. ones, a lot of them I don't get. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, if, what was really interesting when I was studying is that the cell surface markers that, so these are, these are the little markers that are on the surface of the cells that say that only T, only T cells have this 
marker on the surface and um, only B cells have this marker on the surface and cytotoxic T cells have this one and plasma cells have this one. It's the way that we can identify cells even when they're not, they've not got their normal morphology. Um, so a different textbooks say that there's different markers on different cells. So it's really confusing. I tried to memorize them and I went through this paper and then I went to a textbook and I was like, these are completely different. It was really confusing. Anyway, the pathologists know what they're talking about. Send it off for flow cytometry and tell them what you're looking for and they'll run that, that profile. But it is important to give them the clinical background because they don't put all the cell markers in. So if you're trying to differentiate, for example, like a plasma cell tumour from a lymphocytic tumour, you need to tell them that. Um, so that's flow cytometry. Can we do that on aspirate samples? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, look at the um, preparation instructions on the lab websites if you're doing it clinically. I do it every single time I take samples just to make sure that I'm getting maximum kind of um, diagnostic capability out of it. Um, uh, and you essentially just suspend the cells in, in a solution. Um, what about PAR? I think Jonathan mentioned PAR. It looks like clonality on the cells. So the idea is that if you've got a neoplastic population, you'll have a, a disproportionate amount of, of those cells having displaying that clonality compared to normal lymphoid cells. Excellent. Um, is that what situations do we typically use, have to use PAR in? So more to differentiate between B cell and T cell. Oh, actually not so much. So PAR, because you're looking for clonality, it's really useful in situations where you've got a lot of inflammatory lymphocyte, lymphocytic cellular infiltrate and then you've got lymphoma developing from that background of inflammation. So clinically, what's the most common time that we'd sort of say, ah, the cytology is inconclusive. Um, I want to add on PAR because I want to see whether these are a clonal population. Is it if you take um, an aspirate of a submandibular lymph node and dental disease or something like that can cause inflammation? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if there's just that question mark, so um, any inflammatory disease, probably the classic that we use it in is the um, feline gastrointestinal diffuse small cell gastrointestinal lymphoma and trying to work out whether it's inflammatory bowel disease still or whether it's made that transition to lymphoma. Um, what about immunocytochemistry? What does that give us? So I'm just going to blow my nose. Uh, mm -hmm. if it's a B or a T cell. Right. Yeah. So we can't put as many different markers on. We can't look for as many different markers as you can in flow cytometry. But we can put a stain on a slide which binds only to B cells or only to T cells. And we can say, well, the vast majority of these cells are T or B. And therefore, it can't be just normal like inflammation, which should be a combination. So it kind of suggests that there's clonality there. What is the significance of differentiating T and B cell? Why should we do it? Prognostication, mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Treatment-wise, I think, um, I mean, different people use different things, but even for T, people use CHOP. So I'm not sure treatment-wise mm -hmm. it makes that much of a difference. Yeah. They tend to use more, I find... I always defer to an oncologist for chemo protocols. B cell, multicentric B cells, pretty much always chop. And then every time I send off a T cell lymphoma, I get a different protocol back. So I think there's a lot more sort of variation in what you can use for T cells. There are a lot more options of oral medications. So um, like the alkylating agents, sucrophosphamide, mustine, tend to be used more commonly with T cell ones. So it, it does change the protocols, I think. I'd defer to an oncologist, but I wouldn't just chuck chop at a T cell. I'd definitely get a um, oncology consult, whereas I would chuck chop at a B cell if the owners decline consultation. 
Well, do you, you still run? That? Do you still run immunocytochemistry because you're running flow cytometry and everything? Oh, I don't actually run flow cytometry on it, on everything. I oh. typically do cytology, and then if it's um, indicative of lymphoma, I'll do um, immunocytochem. Oh, okay. So, so we're often not doing histo or flow. Okay, okay. Um, going back to that dog with that cranial mediastinal lymphoma, I kind of was like, oh, it's lymphoma because we're talking about lymphoma. What was our other differential there? Thymoma. Good. And that dog was hypercalcemic. Do we see hypercalcemia with thymoma? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So there's actually nothing in our kind of clinical picture that ruled out thymoma. In that situation, I would do flow cytometry um, because they can put markers for thymic cells and lymphocytes on there and neoplastic lymphocytes on there. Um, so that's one of the indications, I think, for flow cytometry. How much influence, I forget how old that dog was, but mm. would there be a certain age population that you're more likely to see thymoma versus? Uh, lymphoma there's actually a the huge problem? overlap they're both kind of middle-aged dog okay. diseases um cystic thymic masses um are more common in younger animals i think but um okay. there's huge overlap okay cool okay i can't remember what's next in our slides oh the spotty spleen it's another example of a spotty spleen so this is actually okay. can i ask a question Yes, go for it. With that ultrasound image that you showed about the mortal spleen, yeah. Yeah, can you have mast cell as a differential? Like in cats, you have more mast cell uh, like in spleen than lymphoma, I think. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, no, you're right. you are right. Um, yes, theoretically, it's a differential. My experience of mast cells is they're more likely to be, um, they're not as hypoechoic. They're not that really sort of, Look, it looks like there's holes punched out of it sort of thing. Um, and they can be actually focal mass lesions, mast cells in the spleen. Um, so I, I would say that mast cells can kind of look like anything, but that paper said very specifically that those hypoechoic nodules are quite specific for lymphoma. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a dog that had hypoechoic nodules, and you can kind of see there's these very hypoechoic ones. These aren't vessels. These are nodules. And then there's all these like sort of faded ones as well. Um, this is a little dog who um, just had a, a liver mass we've been keeping an eye on, um, which we discovered because it had an elevated liver enzymes. It was a very well dog. And I saw this spleen and went, ooh, with the liver mass, I don't love that. Um, we might be dealing with lymphoma here. And I aspirated this spleen, which had those kind of, you know, you could play snap with the, the picture from that paper and it was normal spleen um so it's, it's definitely not always lymphoma <laughs> okay so this is a cat who uh, presented with progressive weight loss and reduction in appetite palpable renomegaly but no azotemia on bloods um does anybody want to tell me about this kidney? I know it's very hard to do it on a still image. Like loss of cortical medullary junction. Yeah, for sure. Doesn't look normal, does it? Not very you always make out a like a uh, imaginoscope. I can see actually a, like a what am I trying to say? There's a, a lesion, like a circular lesion on the <laughs> would that be the caudal bone? Yeah, yeah. So this kidney is too big to fit on my screen, and it was so it's, it was around about double the size I'd expect in a cat. Um, we've got some kind of almost recognizable architecture up here, but then we've got real loss of architecture down here, and this this big sort of mass lesion um, that was quite hypoechoic at the caudal pole of the right kidney, and the left had another mass lesion and loss of more diffuse loss of architecture. We've got a very heterogeneous cortex. So where the cortex, oh, sorry, where the cortex should be quite gray, a uniform gray color, we've got quite sort of dark bits and light bits throughout it. Can everybody appreciate that? 
And the main feature of this that I really wanted to show you just because it's quite pathognomonic for lymph, renal lymphoma is the hypoechoic rim around the kidney. Can everyone see that? Um, so that subcapsular rim is quite specific for um, lymphoma as well if you're ever looking at ultrasound images um, or if you see it in a practical exam, for example. Um, tell me about renal lymphoma in cats. Is that uh, aggressive or low grade typically? I think aggressive. it's aggressive, but it seems to be uh, respond really well to a CHOP protocol in my mm -hmm. hands yeah. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there is sometimes involvement with CNS. Excellent. Lymphoma. Yes. So what was the percentage? 80 uh, no, wait. I don't have a percentage, but a lot of them have neurological involvement. So they often present with CNS signs. And then you feel the kidneys go, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you mentioned it responds well with the CHOP protocol, which then can we deduce whether it's more likely to be B or T cell? More likely to be B. B, good, excellent. Um, oh, I forgot to put a picture in here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so definitely more likely to be B cell in the kidneys, which means it's um, likely to respond to the CHOP protocol. Pretty much any very aggressive lymphomas are going to be more responsive to chemo, whereas the more indolent ones are less responsive but also less progressive. So you might not get that same kind of resolution, like complete remission, but you can usually um, slow down progression. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so the, the last thing I sort of wanted to cover is the alimentary lymphomas in a little bit more detail and sort of different forms of alimentary lymphoma. Um, does anybody have any cases that they kind of have had? I mean, Josh has just um, talked to us about the one with the um, multicentric in the abdomen or leukemia in the abdomen. At the moment that um, presented initially to our emergency department for uh, intersusception that was removed and has come back as elementary lymphoma. Interesting. And it was a focal mass lesion? Uh, not really. So it just, they weren't able to find a specific mass per se, but we, they removed the entire intersusception, sent that off, and we had three separate labs look at it and it came back with mm -hmm. small... Um, did you say cat? Cat. Cat, yeah, interesting. What age? Uh, he is about 12, I think. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the forms of small intestinal diffuse T-cell elementary lymphoma. I've been way too specific about that. Let's talk about the different forms of elementary lymphoma that only occur in the small intestine. Uh, so what might you see clinically? You might see diffuse, so quite subtle. What sort of clinical presentation would you see with, with a diffuse small cell low-grade lymphoma? Chronic vomiting, probably yep. maybe sometimes diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of weight, weight loss. Weight loss. Weight loss, yeah. So clinically, I think we see these IBD cats who have this increased frequency of GI signs. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they start losing weight and I'm like, ooh, it's made a, it's made a, made a um, transformation here. Um, what about when you have that kind of chronic history of vomiting and then you do an ultrasound and there's actually a focal mass lesion? Um, what's that? Is that likely to be kind of diffuse, low-grade T cell? No. No, when I see a mass lesion, I think more of um, more aggressive. More aggressive, yeah, mm, absolutely. Large cell lymphoma. Good. Large and intermediate cell. Sometimes they yeah. just like sit on the fence, these lymphomas. Mm -hmm. Don't go either way. Um, and it actually can be T or B cell when it's a focal mass lesion like that. Um, 
The reason I mentioned this, and I haven't seen this classification system widely used, but in August, the chapter in August talks about the World Health Organization classifications of enteropathy with T-cell lymphoma uh, or um, elementary lymphomas. And they talk about small cell lymphoma that is diffuse as type 2 and small cell lymphoma that is focal and transmural going through the layers in the wall as type 1. And the reason that, that that's important is a lot of the historical papers on feline intestinal lymphoma don't differentiate those two subtypes and they've got very different treatment recommendations and survival times and things like that. So we've sort of got all these papers on elementary lymphoma in cats, but there's actually these two kind of sub um, subcategories that need to be treated and managed quite differently. Have I said that clearly? So focal mass lesion, more aggressive. Do you go to surgery if you see a focal mass lesion? No. I've got no, mixed no, no. 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 If it's causing obstruction, maybe that's probably the scenario. Mm -hmm. I imagine. But if it's um if you've got a diagnosis of lymphoma, I wouldn't normally. No. Um, I think sometimes it's tricky, and uh, if um, I've only had, had it happen twice, but you never ever forget it, is that you start chemo, <clears throat> and then they've got a great bloody hole in their intestine, and they get peritonitis because yeah. there's just no wall structure left, and you're like, oh, oops. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> One of the known risks with elementary, with folk, like transmural elementary lymphoma, um, that you'll cause perforation. So absolutely consideration. Um, there is a paper that says that going to surgery uh, improves survival time with lymphoma, uh, with focal intestinal lymphomas. I mean, quite specific here because there's no way I'm going to recommend surgery if the intestine on either side of that mass is abnormal. So if we've got maybe a sort of more diffuse gastrointestinal change, then I, I'm not as convinced that our anastomosis is going to hold. Um, so I would absolutely recommend surgery in those patients that present with gastrointestinal bleeding or with peritonitis or with an obstruction associated with their mass lesions, but not necessarily in other situations. Um, and that also gives us an opportunity to really understand how is this tumour behaving? Is it epitheliotrophic? Is it T-cell? Is it, you know, we get so much information from that histopathology. Um, and then the other type of elementary lympho, so the, the WHO classifications are the enteropathy associated with T-cell T lympho, which is sm small cell, is the type 2, and then the type 1 is en enteropathy associated with T-cell lympho type 1 transmural, which tend to be either intermediate large cell or granular cell lymphomas. And then... They've also got the diffuse large B cell transmural as a third category, just as far as kind of now as papers come out, they're going to be subcategorized into those three branches. Um, in dogs, oh, no, okay, we've talked about intestinal lymphoma. What about gastric lymphoma? We've talked about that being maybe associated with helicobacter in cats. Is it more likely to be B cell or T cell? Tea. Other way. <laughs> 50, 50. Ah, damn. <laughs> Did I give it a go? <laughs> yeah. So the way I kind of just remember this because gastric and colon are likely to be B and intestines more likely to be T, but can be B as well. So if you if you've got a gastric or a colonic lymphoma, it's more likely to be a focal mass lesion and it's more likely to be B cell in origin rather than a very diffuse one in cats. That is. Um, what about that dog I showed um, the blood tests on? Say we had all the same, we've got an azotemia, we've got a hypercalcemia, but we've also got a globulin of 98. What other differential are we going to chuck on our list? Multiple myeloma. Good. Excellent. Yeah. What 
how would you diagnose multiple myeloma? What what further testing would you like to do with that high globulin? I'd look for Benz Jones proteins in the urine, uh, oh. and then I think you can. I don't know, like it's a monotherapy. electrophoresis or something. Yeah. Yes, electrophoresis. Yeah. Electrophoresis. Yep, yeah, perfect. Um, so serum protein electrophoresis. What information does that give us? Whether it's a monoclonal gammopathy or a poly good clonal gammopathy. That's a mouthful. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, what if it came back as a polyclonal gammopathy? Then I think it would be more inflammatory rather than good. neoplastic. Excellent. And a monoclonal gammopathy is one of the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma. What and um, we've mentioned Benz Jones proteinuria. What are the other diagnostic criteria to sort of actually make a make a call? You need okay. cells in the bone marrow. Good, excellent. So between or greater than ten or twenty percent, depending on which paper you read, is diagnostic. So you've got to ha essentially have two two out of four criteria. So either monoclonal gammopathy, Benz-Jones proteinuria. Um, Plasma, the increased percentage of plasma cells in the bone marrow or, and, or, what's the fourth? What about circulation? Ooh, that would probably be an extension of the bone marrow. It's not one of the criteria okay. on my list. What other symptoms do we see of um, multiple myeloma? Hyperviscosity. Uh, Syndromes and feeding diathesis, that kind of thing. It's that, that, let's talk about that more, but that's not one of the criteria for diagnosis. Would it be what the radiographic right changes? Yes. Yeah. Who said that? Yes. Great. So what was it? Region, radiographic changes. What radiographic changes? Be more specific. The like lytic punched out lesions? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, osteolytic lesions. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're actually really hard to see on radiographs and typically we can see them best on spinous processes, scapula or long bones. So we radiograph the whole animal basically in like lots of detail, little radiographs to try and get as much detail as we can um, or do a CT scan basically. Um, but you've got to have two out of the four of those criteria, the monoclonal gammopathy, osteolytic lesions, um, Benzodiazepine proteinuria or um, plasma cells in your bone marrow. In cats with multiple myeloma, they actually get plasma cell infiltrates in their um, viscera. So similar to a mast cell staging for us with dogs, you could do aspirates of the um, spleen and liver potentially and um, detect plasma cells there. So what we talked about the monoclonal gammopathy, which is just uh, essentially an increase in antibodies because plasma cells produce antibodies. If we've got more plasma cells, we've got more antibodies. Um, that causes hyperviscosity. So as part of our clinical examination investigation, what testing, what should we be looking at? What are the symptoms of hyperviscosity? Look at the eyes. Look at the eyes. Good. Excellent. What will you see? Uh, retinal hemorrhage, or you'll see increased vascular tortuosity. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I've only seen that once, um, and it was really amazing, and I am now I'm yet to, like, I can never find the optic disc. Even. <laughs> now I refer to an ophthalmologist. Um, uh, what is the mechanism of this dog's azotemia? Poor oxygen delivery to the kidney from sludgy blood. Yeah, exactly. So renal perfusion because of the hyperviscosity or the hypercalcemia. So how often do we see hypercalcemia with multiple myeloma? It's only about 20%. It's pretty rare. Um, so we have see eyes. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, have you ever seen hypercalcemia with um, visceral mast cell disease in a cat? No. Okay. Oh, I just had a cat that um, mm -hmm. it was, it's a staff member's cat, and we he was hypercalcemic, which is why we started looking. And then he had um, visceral mast cell disease um, that was removed, and his hypercalcemia is resolved. 
So oh. that's cool. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I like that's that. <laughs> So after your exam, can you let me know what the mechanism of that is? <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely try. Excellent. I have no idea what that could be, but I will. Yeah, have even the pathologist was like, oh. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm really gonna. That's gonna be one of those things that I like. Wake up at two a.m. and go. Mm. <laughs> mm. They thought he had lymphoma in the spleen, so I took the spleen out. To, well, I didn't. The surgeon yes. took the spleen out too, yeah. but it was a normal spleen. Normal spleen. Normal spleen. So where were the mast cells? In his intestine. So we had two oh. focal nodules, um, one in his jejunum and one in his colon. Interesting. He had a cutaneous mast cell 12 months ago that was removed to low grade. Is it a Siamese? No, domestic no? short hair. Yeah. yeah. And he came to me for a bout of diarrhea and um, PUPD. And the owner's a vet nurse, so she was just insane. So we were like, let's do everything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to wrap up because my dog's having time. Uh, <laughs> they know when it's nine o'clock. <laughs> um, and we will, good luck everybody who's sitting next week. Um, if you've got any questions, email through before the um, oral, we'll do a practice exam like we've done the last few years. Um, but if anybody's got any questions they want to run by me in the meantime, let me know. And we'll see you in a fortnight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good luck. No worries. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.